I've never been introduced by my uh, son before, so good job, Eli. Um, I want you to know I, uh, we, we, uh, we're desperate for investors, right? So um, we, we put, our, put kind of our typical road show together, and I have it, and then I don't know who called me and said, well, we don't want you to talk about that. We want, to, want you to talk about leadership. So uh, what I'm hoping is I'm going to run through some slides, let you think about, uh, just to give you some history of what we're about, and then uh, I guess the format is we're going to open it up for Q&A. So let me start here, uh, give you my career. I did this myself, by the way, so I'm proud of, proud of my <laughs> PowerPoint presentation. Uh, Eli mentioned now, the reason I went to Indiana is back then we had a good basketball team. So I just, that's, I just want you to know why I stayed close to home. Uh, today we're not so good, but back then we had a good, um, a good basketball team. And I went straight from Indiana to Columbia Business School. It was a great opportunity for me having grown up, even though my father was from New York and you can't, you know, you're not, even, even though I was born and raised in the Midwest, when you have a father from New York, it kind of rubs off on you in terms of your aggressive quality. So, um, uh, I did go to Columbia, and it was great to kind of get out of the Midwest and see what the, uh, the world was all about. Um, from there, I went to uh, First Boston in the, uh, in the heyday of um, the M&A environment. This was, I graduated Columbia in 1985, and uh, there were two guys that kind of were leading the mergers and acquisition world, uh, Getty Oil, you probably heard about that deal, they were on the cover of Fortune magazine, and that was uh, Bruce uh, uh, Wasserstein and Joe Perella. And Joe really actually kind of became my mentor um, in those days. And uh, Eli will get a kick out of this, but they started their own firm February 2nd of uh, 1988. I know that well because Eli was born like two days or three days ahead of time. And I wasn't in the office when they got, they left, and they really got pissed off at, I can say that, right? Because, okay, I know I'm being taped, but um, <laughs> they got mad at First Boston. This was before it became Credit Suisse. I still call it First Boston. But they got mad at the place because the sales and trading guy lost a lot of money. One of the guys there at that time was Larry Fink. And I don't know if you know who Larry is, but he now runs BlackRock. So... Uh, so I remember getting called. We brought Eli home from the, uh, the hospital. He was two or three days old. And I get a call and say, you know, the, your guys are gone. You know, do you want, where do you want to work? So I was kind of getting solicited from First Boston to stay and Wasserstein Corella to join. And, um, and I didn't know what to do. So I actually asked my dad, I go, what do you think I should do? And he said, look, you should... Learn from the feet of the masters, and um, and in that case, I decided to join with Bruce and Joe, and they started a very successful firm. I left uh, in 1990, and the only a couple of interesting things on Washington Perel, we used to get paid. You know, this was you know if you think back in the 80s, um, we got paid in <coughs> now we got cash bonuses and all this stuff, but we also got pick securities. Okay, so. Um, and I, we always wonder kind of, what, when is this ever going to be paid off? But they ended up selling. I actually made a mistake because I, I should have stayed. They ended up selling Washington Perella to, to a Dresdner Bank for about a billion six. So all this time, this cumulative pick preferred that Bruce Wasserstein came up with actually was <coughs> paid off. And I think I left a lot of money on the table. But um, from there, I... Um, I went, you know, back to the family business. I got a call. It was, we had a big business, uh, uh, but I kind of got a call to come back home and help. And Peter Lineman's here, and he knows all about uh, the real estate cycles, and he can tell you kind of the, the various ones. But one of the worst real estate cycles that we've had was really at the end of the 1980s and early 90s. And when I left um, Washington Pro to come back home, we were basically in the, in the height of kind of the real estate workout. And um, that recession at the time really was primarily a commercial real estate 
recession led by a lot of supply, uh, the SNL crisis, um, and a lot of leverage, um, you know, that would took three, four years to kind of work through. And ultimately, the industry, the commercial real estate industry, got recapitalized by, uh, to some extent, the, the REIT model, um, which brought in public investors to kind of re-equitize um, uh, many, many family businesses. Uh, but also the pension funds got more comfortable with kind of the cash flow characteristics that was available in commercial real estate. So from there, as Eli said, we kind of we went public. It was a big company. Um, and from that period, you know, I guess here, here's kind of the way I was thinking about our business. And I'll, I'll, I'll go through the next slides quickly just to give you a kind of a sense and perspective of our company. But we did the IPO, which was mammoth at the time. And I think the only thing got surpassed by Boston Property Group's um, IPO in, I think it was around the 2000 period of time. Uh, somewhere in that, and they did a little bit bigger. That's because Mort Zuckerman, you know, U.S. He has a lot more quips than I have, so you know, he. I think he was better on the roadshow than we were. Uh, but from our per perspective, the capital gave us the ability to grow. We were trying to think about, you know, the retail platform that we had, how to take advantage of it, create kind of a new paradigm in terms of retail relationships scale, uh, size, driving down our cost of capital. Uh, that kind of led to a number of M&A activities that, um, that uh, you know, I'm well known for, which was basically taking a lot of the characteristics that I learned at Washington Umbrella, First Boston, applying it to real estate, which um, to that point really hadn't been done. Um, you know, in 1996, we did a merger with uh, the Bartolo Realty, uh, which was another kind of old line uh, mall real estate family. It was the first really public to public um, merger in the REIT industry. And, um, uh, and to that point, you know, there, there, no one ever had thought about, can you grow these companies in scale? Can you do typical M&A? And that really created a platform where we ended up doing about $25 billion of deals. And as I talk about how I think about leadership, um, uh, you've got to be an innovator, you've got to be aggressive, and I think the, uh, it's best, the, the best uh, uh, history of that really is kind of the M&A stuff that we did. We did one of the first hostile attempts, which is Taubman. I may have to do it again because you know, we're back to kind of 2002 valuation, so I, I kind of take credit for uh, having a lot of investors think about kind of real estate valuations. It was really cheap company. We kind of went after it uh, at the time when it was trading very cheap. We may have to do it again just to get people thinking about how cheap uh, real estate is. But M&A led to results. I think results ultimately are very important. And any, anything that you do, you got to be results oriented. And I think from there, we've, uh, you know, we're, we're, we've been an industry leader. And uh, we're very focused on maintaining that industry leadership. I was talking to Peter, you know, about um, the REIT model has been very dividend oriented, uh, less earnings oriented, but we've grown our earnings about 9% a year since 1993. And um, one of the things that we just did recently to kind of warehouse our capital was, was instead of paying our dividend in cash, was common stock. And though uh, there's lots of things about it that aren't great, dilution, the investor wants, um, you know, wants cash return to them, obviously. But, you know, sometimes you've got to make very difficult, tough decisions and show leadership, just like what I just saw. I, you know, I'm going to take credit for it first. But... Jamie Dimon cut his dividend to J.P. Morgan. Now, here's a guy that probably didn't have to. They could have kind of, I guess, has managed their way through that, but it saved, you know, $5 billion a year. In our case, not quite that much, but our, we'll increase our cash flow by about $925 million. And that's a lot of money when, you know, when you're really uncertain about what the future prospects of the capital markets are. So 
you know, sometimes you got to take very tough stances and tough decisions. Uh, and hopefully uh, that your shareholders or your colleagues will have confidence in, um, in what you do. Um, now, okay, so this I said, we are an S&P 500 company and we are ranked in terms of the S&P. I think this is actually probably shrinking as we speak, but uh, we're uh, like 195 in terms of our market cap in the uh, in the S&P 500. We're headquartered in Indianapolis, um, and um, Eli considers himself a New Yorker because he was actually born in New York. So uh, despite my uh, trying to not make him a Yankee fan, he is. Um, and this is, I just wanted to show you this, because this is, you, know, you got to be ready for the ebbs and flows of, of life as a public company. But I was just thinking the other day, kind of, you know, it, we all feel bad about kind of what's, how the market is corrected. Uh, stock prices have gone down. So I said, I asked my IR department, when was the last time we were around 35 bucks a share? And it happened to be actually at the very beginning of uh, 03. And I said, I didn't feel that bad at the beginning of 03, even though I had the same stock price. And here's some of the reasons why are, are funds from operation, which is essentially net income plus depreciation, uh, was $936 million. Today, it's a billion eight fifty two. dollars So we've doubled the business, yet our, our stock price is essentially the same. And you can see where our earnings multiple is. And um, the RMZ is kind of the read index. The only good news is we've outperformed that over the last uh, since 03 at 427 to 356. But what else has changed? Well, you know, we're at 2002 levels. We've doubled the size of our company in terms of its profitability. Uh, our number two competitor, you know, which has been a formidable, well known, you know, well thought of company is trading at 50 cents a share. It's on the verge of bankruptcy. So, you know, you got to be ready for um, for the worst. Yet, yet, yet you know, yet, th this is what's possible in public markets, and you can't be discouraged. So, even though I felt a lot better at the beginning of 03, um, you can't be discouraged. You got to be confident that you're going to kind of sort your way, you know, through the next several years. Um, and it's all about expectations, as, as you, Peter, knows about the stock market. Well, the expectations, you know, that our earnings are going to go down versus in 03, they probably thought our earnings were going to be go up. And in fact, they were right. I don't think they thought we were going to go up that high. Um, we operate from five platforms. So we consider ourselves as a retail real estate company, more than just a mall company. Hopefully, some of the assets that uh, uh, you know, uh, that we have out here, the Philadelphia Premium Outlet Center, which we just opened last year, and we uh, own a piece of uh, King of Prussia Mall, so hopefully some of you are still going out shopping or at least waiting for your parents to, to uh, support uh, some shopping excursions. Go back to this. Um, you know, one of the things is we were growing our business and to contrast it to general growth, which has kind of been our number two competitors, we've always, whenever, whenever I did an M&A deal, I always did it, you know, with an eye toward the balance sheet. Um, and the reason is, I when I got back to Indianapolis in 1990, the real estate world was on its ass. Um, there was lots of defaults, lots of restructuring going on, and I felt like if we were ever going to get out of this and grow the company. One thing we would do it is with a sound balance sheet. So we did a lot of comp, you know, when we did a deal, we would issue our stock or we would issue convertible preferred. Uh, we um, created a lot of unencumbered assets, which gives you financial flexibility. And um, we're, one, I think, one of the few REITs that are A minus. I don't think actually there is another REIT that has a, a better rating than that. And um, as they downgrade companies left and right, at least they've maintained our, um, you know, our investment grade rating here. Um, our capital and liquidity is very strong. And I added to that. I mean, I made a very tough decision, as I said to you, 
about the dividend in that we're going to add another $925 million of free cash flow this year because we're preparing for the worst. And I think as a leader, you, you know, you have a kind of a dual personality. You got to be very aggressive yet, you know, you can't roll the dice where if you make a mistake, you blow the, you blow the business out. And, you know, shareholders want you to, shareholders by and large, uh, believe it or not, want you to roll the dice, um, you know, for it and, and try and make the big play because at the end of the day, if they don't like what you did, they sell the stock, but you're left with the company and you've got to figure out how to run the company. So, you know, you you want to listen to shareholders, but at the end of the day, you got to rely on yourself um, and what you think the right thing to do is. Um, so stable performance, no one, you know, other than no one cares, but our earnings are pretty stable, even though you read about retail headlines. We're not a retailer. You know, we're the landlord collecting rent, and absolutely that job is harder today than it has been in the past. Um, but it, um, you know, as when we went public, as an example, retail has a lot of volatility. But seven out of the top ten tenants that we had when we went public are no longer in business today, yet we've been able to grow our business because it's the real estate that retains the value over the long term. Um, this is kind of the stuff that we've done over the years. Uh, the DeBarlo deal was a friendly merger, stock to stock. The, uh, this shows you a couple of the deals where I've been aggressive. Retail Property Trust is a deal I broke up. They were getting ready to go public. It was owned by a group of pension funds. Uh, they were going to kind of merge three different groups together, New England, uh, which we ended up buying down the road in, uh, in 99, but not at that time. But we, uh, there were three companies that were going to merge and go public. I didn't want another competitor. So the kind of company they were going to take public, I went straight to the institutional investors, uh, made them rely on their fiduciary duty and bought that company lawsuits here and there, but you know, we got the job done. <laughs> Corporate property investors, um, uh, it goes to show you that things ebb and flow in cycles. Um, this was another big company, great retail assets that was owned by a group of pension funds. They were getting ready to merge with the Rouse Company, which is um, kind of Baltimore based and General Growth bought it. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and again, I didn't want a bigger guy coming along, and I tried to solicit CPI, but they, you know, didn't want to hear because they were going to do this kind of gentlemanly merger, and everybody was going to be spared, uh, you know, their jobs and all this stuff. And I went straight to the pension funds, um, and they were Dutch pension funds, and so on. And said, look, we can offer you a better price. We can bring you in as shareholders and grow the business better. Uh, and it was a, it was basically a bake-off between me and the chairman and CEO of Rouse. Somehow I convinced them, and we ended up doing that deal. And Rouse kind of went on their merry way, and that's General Growth, our number two competitor, ended up buying them for all cash. At the same time, we bought Chelsea Property Group, and it led essentially to General Growth's bankruptcy. So. Um, in CPI, the only other interesting point was we owned the GM building. That was part of the CPI portfolio of assets. And in 1998, believe it or not, we, we hired Lazard to go sell the building because that's not our business, the office building. I needed to sell it to kind of finance the transaction. We had no bidders, none. Okay, now it's sold for, you know, Peter, I mean, it, it's been sold, restructured, sold at two, two, three billion dollars, right? Yeah. Um, and it was funny because we had Donald Trump call, and you know, at that point, Donald Trump, you know, had no money, and so I didn't even return his phone calls. He, by the way, he doesn't have any money again, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> but he called, and I said, you know, I gave it to somebody else to follow up, and they went to New York. 
And then I got a call from an Indianapolis-based insurance company that was a high flyer uh, by the name of Conseco. And they said, we're going to fund Donald and we're going to buy the building. And it was, this was when the Pacers were a good basketball team. And I think we had a playoff game with the Knicks, you know, uh, that day. And uh, Hilbert was the chairman. He came by, shook my hand, did the deal exactly the way he said it was. And uh, we got, I was really tickled pink on the price that we got given that we had no cover bid, meaning we had no second bidder other than maybe Bernardo and Steve Roth. And that's not the spot you want to be in, right? Peter knows that very well. And the last thing you want to do is call Steve Roth and say, you know, will you buy this building for me, please? Um, but I think, we, um, I think we demonstrated through a lot of this activity just being aggressive, knowing how to finance the deal. Uh, 2002 is very interesting because Rodamco actually closed in January of 2002. But we struck the deal in December of 2001. And as you know, that was two months after 9-11. And, um, you know, no one knew what the consumer was going to do. <coughs> no one knew how you were going to finance anything. Uh, but we were decided that we, now we partnered with Westfield and a couple other people to do the deal. But it was a sign of, you know, sometimes you got to take an aggressive approach to create value. And the only other thing I'll tell you on this deal, uh, Chelsea, which is a premium outlet business, which is a great real, retail real estate. Um, in 04, I had the decision, I kind of had a decision tree to buy Rouse at a, you know, at a very low cap rate or very high price. And I contrasted that to kind of the premium outlet business, which has unique growth characteristics. It's very much of a duopoly in terms of the, you know, who runs that. It's very profitable for the landlord plus the retailer. And we decided to go ahead and buy that. We also bought it with some stock. And General Growth ended up buying Rouse. And, you know, the rest is, as they say, uh, about to be history. So that just gives you our performance over the, um, over, over the, uh, over the <coughs> period of time. And I will tell you, you know, even though my background, I learned, you know, going to Wall Street, the great thing about Wall Street is it's dog years. So, you know, for those of you who've gone and come back, we, you know, we all know that a year of experience on Wall Street is four or five and many other places, especially in those days in the <coughs> late 80s. You know, the word was, it'll never get back. You'll we'll never have the M&A business. Well, it comes back, uh, but some of these cycles, um, you know, do take time, but I will tell you, I've learned a tremendous amount um, over being public. And it, it is not only how to lead, but how to lead by example. Uh, results are, at the end of the day, all that, all that matters, frankly. Um, and, you know, what you did for investors is not so much that important. It's what you're going to do going forward. But one of the funny stories I remember is we went public in December of 03. And this just shows you how clueless we were. So we had two weeks of operation in 03. And so then someone knocked on our door and said, do you know we have to do an annual report for two weeks at the end of 03? So you do learn a lot over this period of time. <laughs> we're proud of our uh, record. And uh, we've had good performance. I don't like 08, so I'll skip this quickly. But we've outperformed <laughs> the REIT index, even in 08. Um, so summary, um, you know, we've been growing our earnings. I think we'll still have positive earnings growth in 09. That's going to be a challenge. Um, and you can see kind of uh, the stability of our asset base. And, um, you know, but you got to make tough decisions. And, the market. Now let me turn before I go to questions. I did this quickly about kind of what do I think is important for traits of leadership. And I and at the end of the day, I think it's you know I believe strongly that leadership traits can be learned, but great leaders are, are essentially born. You know, I, it's very hard to create. Uh, it, you, you can train, you can do it, but a lot of it is innate. Uh, first of all, I think you have to have unbelievable technical 
expertise and skills. Um, I don't think you can go in and be a great leader if you can't talk the talk and walk the walk. And um, um, and I think I got most of that, frankly, through, you know, and again, I agree, Columbia is not quite important, but don't tell the Columbia guys this. Um, but you, you, you know, the MBA undergraduate gives you the foundation, uh, financial foundation is very important. Um, and to this day, a lot of the accounting and a lot of the stuff that, that I've applied, not only in kind of moving my way up, but in just running the business today was really based upon my undergraduate and graduate experience. Um, I think you gotta make tough, you gotta be able, you gotta be a decision maker, and you gotta, you know, a lot of this is elementary, but you gotta, you gotta be a decision maker. You can't just ponder, you gotta, you gotta make moves, and you gotta exhibit Toughness. Now, toughness can be decided by a lot of different. You know, that's that to me is a style issue. But at the end of the day, you got to be able to make tough uh, decisions um, in order to be an effective leader. Uh, I think you got to be aggressive. I think a lot of what we've done in growing our business has been through aggressive activity. You have to be somewhat contrarian in order to really excel and outperform. And you gotta be a risk taker. That doesn't mean you gotta be stupid about it um, and you wanna hedge your bets, but um, I don't think you can, you, I don't think you can go from X to Y without those three traits. Um, uh, you must lead by example, um, and I think a lot of that is work ethic and rolling up your sleeves. And ultimately, you have to, whatever style you have, I don't think there's any one particular style. Um, I just think your style evolves and it's got to be ultimately what you are and what your style is. So if you're a consensus builder, you should use that style. If you're an autocrat, you could do that. And um, um, But you got to trust your instincts. You got to have good sound business judgment. And I think, um, um, you know, you got to, you know, you, business is all about judgment, uh, pros and cons, return on investment, um, and 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 I think uh, kind of roll that all into into one. But you know, that's why at the end of the day, I think skills are critical. But a lot of this is just your innate gut in order to be the most effective leader. Communication, I think, is critical, um, especially today when communication is rampant and immediate. Um, and I think um, communication skills are more and more important. Uh, so employees, and this is, I would tell you this is not today, but as you can see, I stumble over my speech, but uh, when talking to employees, clients, partners, Wall Street, uh, articulating what your vision is, uh, how you're trying to approach things, uh, consistency approach is all very, very important. So, um, you know, curriculum, I think, has changed a lot, um, you know, over 23 or 4 years since I've been in business school. But, um, it's hard to believe, but, but um, you know, you got to be a good communicator. And it's really important, uh, both internally and externally. I mean, we, when I did the dividend move, um, I wanted to explain it to the employees, so we kind of had a town hall meeting, which, you know, not necessarily my style, but brought everybody in and said, look, here's the facts, you know, and here's why we're doing what we're doing. Um, consistency, I think, is important, business judgment. And the final point that, uh, before we open up the Q&A, that I'd like to, you know, true leadership is uh, really easy when, you know, when, Rising tide uh, uh, lifts all boats. But I think the best leaders really are going to exhibit themselves when times are, you know, the toughest. Um, and so hopefully, uh, you know, us and some of the other REIT members, uh, real estate companies are going to be able to exhibit a better leadership in this recession than we did in the early 90s. Um, 
uh, it, it remains to be seen. But I will tell you that I think true leaders uh, develop and are shown in, um, in these kind of difficult um, times. So I think that's it. Oh, uh, this is this is this stuff. I'm not going to go through. So you can. I don't. Are we handing this stuff out, or what are we doing? If you want my view on macro yeah. real estate, yeah. oh, you do. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm going to keep talking to you. Um, all right. Look, I think Peter. You know, you should take. You still teach, or you're like retired? Okay. <laughs> um, well, when Peter used to teach, he would do this much better. But look, I think the, I think the bottom line is, um, you know, real estate, there's a big distinction between residential and commercial real estate. Um, unfortunately, commercial real estate is correlated to the economic, uh, uh, is, uh, is correlated to economic times. And, um, and so real estate, from a cash flow point of view, has been in 08 it was strong, 07 it was strong, um, but the economy is going to take its toll on real estate cash flow. So um, that is going to put uh, pressure on a lot of companies. Now, we've also kind of what's happened in the, um, I will tell you in the REIT market, our adjustment to the market value has been rapid and swift. And so we, you know, a, a good example of a regional mall, a good regional mall historically would trade anywhere from a kind of a six to an eight cap rate. Our company today on a capitalization rate trades around 10%. And it's really at a high, historical high. I don't know, Peter, you would know best, you know, when that lasts now. They may not know the cap rate. Yeah. The inverse of the multiple. Right. So a five cap is a 20 multiple. Uh, uh, right. So you know we've had our our you know we ended in our stock kind of at a seven six seven cap rate in the eighties, and now we're in the mid thirties, and that's basically a ten cap rate. So what we haven't seen though is private values really impact that. So all the endowments, all the pension funds are still basing their values on old cap rates. Now I think the market's overcorrected, but until there's clarity on how the mortgage market um, comes back, I think the, you're going to see pressure on real estate uh, public market values. And um, and look, I think that the companies are going to delever. Um, and the big issue is what's going to happen with all the secured financing uh, that's going to that's going to uh, that's going to come up over the next several years. There's uh, roughly a trillion dollars in the um, CMBS market, and uh, the, the maturities are not that big in nine, but they start to ladder pretty up in 10, 11, 12. And so, you know, some of those are over levered. Some of those are going to need write downs. Obviously, Washington's very concerned about the. You know, you know, what the banks hold on their balance sheets in terms of commercial real estate. So um, from our standpoint, we don't need uh, the high leverage on a property, but we do need a mortgage market to kind of uh, maintain our financial uh, wherewithal. Um, and and uh, th I will tell you that the rapid decrease in values is worldwide. So you've seen it in China, Singapore, uh, uh, every uh, Hong Kong, Europe, the UK is is uh, probably the most dramatic, and uh, lots of equity coming to the market. So I think the shareholders decided, look, they're going to re-equitize a handful of the best real estate companies in the world, and the rest of them they're going to go by the way uh, go by the wayside. So. Um, this just gives you a sense of kind of a uh, uh, U.S. commercial thing. Not a lot of transactions, so a lot of value is like what's, you know, what what is something worth? Well, when there's no buying and selling, you know, you've got a, you've got a, um, you know, a significant problem in trying to trying to uh, sort through that. And 
and the market itself, commercial real estate, I mean, I don't know if I believe any of these numbers, but uh, they're better than numbers we get from China. There are $6 trillion of real estate, commercial real estate value. It's a, it's a little over half levered. Um, and you can see kind of where, where the debt is. Um, um, so, like I said, you got a trillion coming due over the next three years. So there's going to be there's going to be some workouts. So that's not just in the CMBS market. The CMBS market's the securitized market. So it's a little bit like what you've seen in the residential side in terms of the CMBS. Now the CDO market never really hit commercial real estate because you can't slice and dice them. They're too unique and big to do it. But um, um, so the workouts, if there are several, ought to be a little bit easier to deal with. But um, you know, we're just gonna, we're just beginning to see it. Um, you know, the the um, yeah, this is a good example that in shows you how things. And as a leader, this is kind of you got to be ready for some of this. Not quite this, but AAA, essentially a security-rated AAA, the best of the a breed. Um, a year ago, we're trading at swaps plus 85. And today, AAA is swaps plus 1,050 basis points. Um, and in November of 08, there were 15 swaps plus 1,500. So it's basically the, the Treasury's um, uh, risk-free rate essentially plus 1,500 basis points. Well, I can tell you that if you know Treasury's at three and you got to add thousand basis points to it, you know, that's going to be tough to make any math work for anything. So um, this market is completely shut down and a lot of real estate companies and individual <coughs> entrepreneurs really uh, relied on that. High, high unsecured um, market is interesting. Very few of the public real estate companies really have used this. We, we are one of them. Um, I think this market is beginning to open up. It's clearly, this is very important because it's clearly opened up in the corporate market. So you've seen Procter & Gamble, you saw Roche, uh, you've seen some energy companies tap into this market. Spreads have uh, narrowed significantly. Uh, but just to give you a sense of our volatility, our CDS, which basically um, our credit default swaps, were 80 to 85 basis points in May of 08, and in fact, we did a billion five bond deal in the that averaged kind of five and a half to six percent, which was essentially 85 over um, over uh, over the swap rate back then. And um, they went as high as actually a little higher than that, but in December of 08, they were 700 to 750 over, and then and now they've narrowed somewhat. They're kind of moving down. But you know, you can see one of the biggest challenges that we have, and that basically most any companies trying to make investments is what is our cost of capital? Well, it's really hard to figure out when you have this kind of volatility um, occurring on your on your debt side as well as your equity. So uh, you got you know, I got to tell you, I wasn't that ready for that kind of volatility. We certainly kind of felt like early 08 things were slipping a little bit in terms of the economy. Um, and we did take advantage of kind of some things to re-equitize re and refinance a number of things. But I don't think anybody, anybody anticipated this. And um, so to some extent, we're all scrambling. Some of us are doing it better than others. But, um, you know, re re multiples are low. I just tell you that I, Peter and I just mentioned it. I mean, we're we're trading. So imagine this. I mean, they they historically been about a ten times. That's our, which is basically our cash flow. Re multiples FFO is just net income plus depreciation. Historical's been around ten. The read industry seven seven. We're trading at five. And part of that is because you know retail is, you know, just front page. Uh, news, so I think we're getting a little bit of that as well. Uh, but I do think REITs have corrected the real estate pricing uh, uh, well ahead. And I do think, you know, that it sounds like the government is headed toward 
trying to reboot the securitized market through TAL. Now, we're doing, doing that on student loans, credit card receivables, and it sounds like they're headed to do that on the commercial mortgage side because they don't want to see the financial system at more peril because, you know, we've got a lot of bad commercial <coughs> Hope this isn't depressing you. So, uh, REIT's response, I mean, I think we've all decreased capital. We've all cut cost. You know, we're bringing in equity partners. Uh, we're, we're doing dividend cuts. I think, a lot, you know, there's a handful, you know, there'll be a lot of winners. There'll be a lot of losers. Uh, there'll be a handful of REITs ultimately that'll take advantage of this kind of massive, massive dislocation, but only, I don't think anybody's ready to pull the trigger to they kind of get a sense of, um, you know, what their cost of capital is. So, I, I'm not going to read this to you. So, <laughs> that's it. Thanks. And, um,